Today, we are continuing our sermon series titled, Us Versus Them. In the series, we're taking a look at a number of hot-button issues over which people are strongly divided, and our approach is to try to bring some biblical principles to apply uh, so that we can bring some life to a deadlocked world. The hot-button issue for today is believer versus unbeliever. I want to address the notion that uh, those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ for eternal life are somehow pitted against those who have not believed in Jesus. I want to speak to the idea that believers are the good guys and unbelievers are the bad guys. I want to discuss the perception that we are morally superior, they are inferior. We are the salt that keeps society from rotting. They are the decay that threatens. We are the light that exposes evil. They are the cockroaches that run from the light. We are the Christian crusaders against the heathens. The Babylon Bee is a popular source of Christian satire and humor. Uh, It's Christians poking fun at um, modern cultural conceptions or, or quirks. In their recent book, How to Be a Perfect Christian, they touch on the believer versus unbeliever theme in a chapter titled Crusading Against the Heathens. Here's an excerpt, and I quote, We recommend learning to harbor a healthy disdain for everyone who isn't a Christian. When you start seeing other people as less than human, it's much easier to scream vulgarities at them to the glory of God. You earned your salvation fair and square while they choose to wallow in their ignorance and not pull themselves up by their spiritual bootstraps. So it's time to begin thinking of unbelievers, not as fellow image bearers, desperately in need of God's grace, but as vermin who threaten the very existence of your comfortable Christian subculture. One great way to get the message of God's love out there is to make offensive signs, to attract attention and let people know just how much God hates them, just as the Apostle Paul did at Mars Hill. Then organize a protest at absolutely every event in the area that doesn't line up with your idea of what God likes. You can even change the eternal fate of waiters and waitresses by leaving a Bible verse on your credit card receipt instead of a tip. Scribble something down like, God only gets 10%. Why would you think you deserve 15%? And follow it up with John 3.16, Jesus loves you, unquote. Of course, this is satire. It is a caricature There's some truth to this. Perhaps you're like me. Uh, Maybe you have noticed in some others, maybe even in yourself, a tendency to see unbelievers as adversaries. Maybe you've noticed an us versus them attitude. Well, the text we're going to study today is Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. From this text, we're going to learn from Jesus himself about the posture he wants his followers to take toward unbelievers. Jesus is going to show us our position as Christians in relation to non-Christians. In this text, Jesus uses two metaphors, salt 
and light to describe uh, what we are to be as his followers. Salt and light represent who we are. Uh, It's what we do. I want to try to understand what these two metaphors mean, beginning with salt. In verse 13, uh, Jesus presents the salt metaphor, saying, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, to discover what the salt metaphor means, we need to understand the function of salt as it would have been understood by Jesus' original audience, mostly first century Jews. Only one problem. Scholars have identified no less than 11 different uses of salt in the ancient world. It had so many different uses that it was highly valued. In fact, salt was so valuable that the Romans sometimes paid their soldiers in salt. If a soldier did not do his duty, he was said not to be worth his salt. In fact, that's where we get the expression we use today, uh, worth his salt. So we can safely say that the salt metaphor carries the general idea of value. Christ followers add value to the world in a broad sense, but we're left to figure out specifically which of the many valuable functions of salt Jesus had in mind. Probably the most prevalent use of salt in the ancient world was as a preservative. They didn't have refrigerators back then, so people used salt to preserve food, to to keep it from going bad. For this reason, perhaps the most common interpretation of the salt metaphor is that Christians serve as a kind of preservative in the world. The idea is that our role is to to keep society from rotting, to prevent moral decay, to preserve goodness. Many, and perhaps most, commentators take this position, including one very fine scholar whom I respect. In commenting on this text, he explains, and I quote, We Christians should be more courageous more outspoken in condemning evil. Condemnation is negative, to be sure, but the action of salt is negative. Sometimes standards slip and slide in a community for want of a clear Christian protest, unquote. The idea is that just as uh, one function of salt is negative, negating decay, so the function of Christians in the world should be negative, to to speak out against evil, to condemn moral decay, to to protest immorality. Now, the interpretation of salt as a preservative is certainly plausible, but with all due respect, I think it's probably wrong. Let me offer my reasoning, and, and you can judge the merits of it yourself. When considering a particular interpretation, it's always wise to ask the question, does this interpretation carry an idea that is corroborated elsewhere in Scripture? Does this interpretation reflect a clear theme woven throughout the Bible? Could we defend the very same idea from other passages in the Word of God, particularly in the New Testament? One problem I have with the uh, preservation view of salt is that I'm hard-pressed to find in the life of Jesus or in the New Testament a clear and corroborating mandate for Christians to keep pagan society from rotting. In the earthly ministry um, of Jesus, his priority does not seem to be on making pagans behave better. He doesn't seem to expect non-Christians to act like Christians. He seems to be more concerned with the inner transformation of individuals who first become Christians 
by believing in him for eternal life and then are empowered to follow his ways as they abide in him. To be sure, it can be argued that the internal transformation of individuals ultimately leads to external preservation of goodness in culture as more and more people become more and more like Christ. But the biblical emphasis seems to be on the root, internal transformation, not external conformity. I think this is significant, but but not the most compelling argument for rejecting the preservation view of salt. The most compelling argument comes directly from our text. Notice in verse 13, Jesus says that salt becomes worthless for the function God has in mind when it has lost its taste. Now, the phrase uh, lost its taste is a translation of a single original Greek word that means to become tasteless, to become insipid, to be without sufficient flavor, to be pleasing, to be bland or flavorless. Jesus' mention of uh, the taste of salt has no connection with its function as a preservative. Rather, it points directly to another function of salt as a seasoning agent. Salt imparts flavor. It makes food attractive. This is not a negative function, but a positive one. The use of salt as a flavor enhancer is very ancient. In Job 6.6, one of the oldest books in the Bible, Job asks, Can that which is tasteless be eaten without salt? Salt makes bland food flavorful. And if that's the function of salt Jesus has in mind, then how are we believers to be salty? Uh, Here's what I think the idea is. Just as salt makes food more palatable, our Christ-likeness makes the claims of Christ more palatable to the world. And so to be salty is to be like Christ. To be salty is to live as Jesus lived. People are attracted to Christ as they see Christ in us. We help people develop a taste for Jesus who describes himself repeatedly as the bread of life in John 6. And there are other scriptures that support this interpretation. For example, Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Here, being um, salty in relationship with the world of outsiders is associated with being gracious, not judgmental. It's positive, not negative. The New Living Translation renders the same verses this way. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Elsewhere, uh, Christian slaves or employees are urged to be Christ-like as a means of being salty or making the Lord attractive uh, to unbelievers. Titus chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 says, Slaves, must always obey their masters and do their best to please them. They must not talk back or steal, but must show themselves to be entirely trustworthy and good. Then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. When we live as Jesus lived, we attractively show how good he is. Now, as a sidebar in this text in Titus, Paul is not condoning slavery. Rather, he's merely acknowledging the reality of slavery in that 
time and culture. In fact, Paul is actually honoring slaves here by speaking to them as fellow believers, as as equals. The immediately preceding context um, of our text in Matthew 5 is also supportive of the flavor enhancement view of salt. Being salty is the culmination of all the beatitudes that came before. It's the result of being poor in spirit and being one who mourns and being gentle and being one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness and and being uh, merciful and being pure in heart and being a peacemaker. These are positive elements of Christ-likeness. If you live them out, you will stand out and you will make Christ attractive. So it seems reasonably clear to me that to be salty is to be Christ-like. Just as salt makes food more palatable, our Christ-likeness makes the claims of Christ more palatable to the world. But what if believers are not Christ-like? What if we become tasteless? What if we are not distinctive at all? What if we add nothing to the world? What, what if we are no different? Well, Jesus presents this as a real possibility. And he says, when, when we become tasteless, we become worthless as representatives of Christ, worthless at making Christ attractive. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to hell. That doesn't mean that we ourselves are intrinsically worthless. worthless. It doesn't mean that God no longer loves us. It just means that we're not fulfilling our God-given purpose as salt. That's what Jesus is saying in the last part of verse 13, where he describes tasteless salt this way. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, in the first century, uh, when salt became worthless for anything else, people would throw it on the ground where they wanted a hard path because salt had a hardening effect on the soil. And then people would walk right over it and ignore it. Jesus makes a similar point in John 15, verses 6 through 8, using yet another metaphor. Jesus is the vine. We believers are the branches. When we do not abide in him, when we're not loving or Christ-like, then unbelievers in the world gather us up and throw us into the fire That is, they consider us to be worthless, just something to be burned. But when we do abide in him, when we are Christ-like, our love and our fruitfulness glorifies God, and we prove to the world that we are followers of Christ. Well, we've touched on the salt metaphor. Just as salt makes food more palatable, Our Christ-likeness makes the claims of Christ more palatable to the world. We become a living invitation for unbelievers to take Jesus, the bread of life, for themselves. Now, what about the light metaphor? What does it mean to be light? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, Jesus says this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven." Now, a common interpretation of our role as light in the world, based on this passage, is that we believers ought to shed light on or to reveal the world's sin. We are to point out uh, that which is immoral among the pagans and take a stand for what is righteous and moral. The idea seems to be, according to many, 
shine the light and the cockroaches will run. And much like the preservation view of Saul, this exposing evil view of light is negative. It focuses on what is wrong. In this vein, I've heard some Christians say that our role, based on Matthew 5, is to expose the evil deeds of darkness in this world. And this may seem to have a a biblical ring to it in as much as it seems to borrow some language from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, where Paul says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. The only problem is that Ephesians 5.11 is talking about exposing evil among believers within the church. It's not about exposing evil among pagans in the culture. Moreover, elsewhere in the Bible, it says our primary role as believers is not to judge those outside the church. For example, in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 and 13, the Apostle Paul says, It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. In fact, I am once again hard-pressed to find in the life of Jesus or in the teachings of the New Testament a clear and corroborating mandate for Christians to expose the evil deeds of unbelievers in our culture. Well, then what does being the light of the world mean? A careful look at our text reveals what the light is and, and what it's for. According to verse 16, The light seems to be our good works. It says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. Like light, good works shine that others may see. We're to shine by doing good works. Now, this may seem like God is calling us to be maybe self-righteous show-offs, But that notion is dashed when we consider that the good works are represented by the immediately preceding context. Being the light of the world is the result of the good works of being poor in spirit and being one who mourns and being gentle and being one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness and being merciful and being pure in heart and being a peacemaker. These are extraordinary qualities but not self-promoting, not showy. And verse 16 also gives the purpose of shining the light of our good works. It's not so that we'll get the applause. Our good works are to be made visible so that the world will glorify our Father, so that people will praise Him for how good He is. Verse 16 says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, And give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The light of our good deeds lets people see how good God is. It lifts him up where people can see. It's unmistakable. In verse 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Ancient cities in the the area in that time were were often set on a hill for a number of reasons. First, it was cooler on a hill. In that arid Middle Eastern land, the only air conditioning they had was a breeze. Also, a city on a hill uh, was also easier to defend against attack. And at night, a city on a hill would glow for miles in the dark, making it easier for travelers to find their way to the city. Similarly, our light makes it easier for people to find their way to God. In verse 15, Jesus zooms in from the glow of a city to the glow of a household. He says, Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, 
and it gives light to all in the house. Our light helps people see. It helps them find their way to God. So what is our role in the world as Christians in relation to non-Christians? We are to be salt and light. That is, we are to give the world a taste and a glimpse of who Jesus is. To be salt and light is to give a taste and a glimpse. In fact, that's the big big idea of this sermon. We give the world a taste and a glimpse of who Christ is. We are the salt and the light, a taste and a glimpse. And so our fundamental posture and position as believers is not to be against unbelievers. On the contrary, we are here for them, for them, not to make them behave better, not to self-righteously scold them, not to belittle or berate or bemoan them, but to lovingly give them a taste and a glimpse of who Christ is, which raises some important questions. How do we taste? What optics are we presenting? Does it add up to irresistible influence or insipid irrelevance? Salty or tasteless? On a lampstand or under a basket? This is really close to my heart, not only because it's scriptural, but also because I didn't grow up in church I didn't have a religious upbringing. I didn't come to faith until I was in college. And I experienced firsthand the feelings of an outsider in evangelical Christian circles. My first exposure to real Christians was when I began dating Kathy upon graduation from high school. She was a Christian headed for a Christian college in California where dancing and um, drinking were not allowed. I was a heathen headed for a public university in Arizona where beer was as essential as books. Kathy was always gracious to me and um, not judgmental judgmental at all. We, we dated and debated about uh, spiritual things. But she was not pushy, not self-righteous. She was salt and light to me. But I was still wasn't buying Christianity, uh, partly because I found a lot of other Christians to be tasteless and dim. For example, uh, Kathy invited me into a church service where one of her professors at the Christian college she attended was, was a guest speaker. And uh, in the sermon, he... Uh, railed against unbelievers, and at one point, he called us pigs, and I squealed under my breath. I was fuming. I I remember nothing about Christ, nothing about grace, nothing about the gospel. Maybe it was all there, but I couldn't hear it. All I remember is the word pigs and how demeaned I felt, not only because of what the speaker said, but by the affirming response of many in the congregation. It felt like a Christian lynch mob. Kathy was shocked and embarrassed. She feared that the door had been slammed on me coming to faith in Christ, and it was for a while. Seems like I kept running into one Christian jerk after another on TV, in the churches where Kathy invited me, and at the Christian college where I visited her uh, repeatedly uh, in many different ways, some subtle, some not so subtle. These jerks were able to convey their assessment very clearly. I was less than, inferior, dirty, unwanted. I was the heathen 
Kathy was not supposed to be dating. But thankfully, there were those like Kathy who seemed to represent something entirely different, something attractive. They gave me a taste and a glimpse of something that drew me. They were gracious and respectful and loving. When I visited Kathy in California, she would almost always insist that we take some time to go visit Mabel, uh, an elderly woman in a nearby nursing home who had no family. I began to read a Bible that, that Kathy gave me It was the first time I had ever read the Bible in my life. Um, At first, I read it for the purpose of discrediting it, to to be honest. I began asking questions, some of which uh, reflected my skepticism, but, but Kathy was not put off or threatened by my questions, nor did she pretend to have all the answers. Eventually, I came to believe in Jesus for eternal life in the summer between my freshman and sophomore years of college, but I didn't tell anyone at first, in part because I didn't want Kathy to think that I was doing it just for her, and in part because I didn't want to be associated with the Christian jerks. And I still don't. Today, I want to be salt and light because it's scriptural, because I know for sure that's exactly, exactly what I needed as an unbeliever. We give the world a taste and a glimpse of who Christ is. Let's pray. Lord, help us to be salt and light. Help us to give others a taste and a glimpse of how good you are, that they may be saved and that you may be glorified. Amen.